This is MIT Technology Review. I feel like I haven't really had the time to process everything that happened and its repercussions emotionally, and that I'm just sort of going and going and going. I feel like I'll probably fall apart at some point when there's a little bit of a lull. But right now, I'm just highly concerned about my team and the people sort of supporting me and the types of risks they're taking and making sure that they're safe and they're not retaliated against. Earlier this month, the co-lead of Google's ethical AI team, Timnit Gebru, announced via Twitter that the company had forced her out. She's known for co-authoring a groundbreaking paper showing face recognition to be less accurate at identifying women and people of color. She's also known for co-founding the nonprofit Black and AI, a group that champions diversity in tech and gathers civil rights activists, labor organizers, and leading AI researchers. The team Gebru helped build at Google includes many leading experts in their own right, and it's one of the most diverse in the industry. Peers in the field have envied it for producing critical work that often challenged mainstream practices. Despite all of that, she lost her job, and her exit appears to be the culmination of a conflict over another paper she co-authored. Other leaders in the field of AI ethics have since argued the company pushed her out because of the inconvenient truth she was uncovering about a core line of its research and perhaps its bottom line. The head of Google AI, Jeff Dean, who is referenced in this recording, told his colleagues via email that the paper didn't meet Google's bar for publication, and that Gebru said she would resign unless Google met a number of conditions it was unwilling to meet. Gebru's former manager, Sammy Bengio, who she also references here, said he was stunned by how the company handled the situation. At the time of this recording, more than 2,500 people who work for Google have signed a letter of protest along with more than 4,000 other supporters from academia, industry, and civil society. I'm Jennifer Strong. In this episode, Timnit Gebru speaks with senior AI reporter Karen Howe. We offered Google the chance to comment on record, but it declined. That email from Dean is linked in our show notes, along with more of Karen's reporting on this latest paper and a longer version of this interview, which has been edited for length and clarity. Let's go. In Machines We Trust. I'm listening. A podcast about the automation of everything. You have reached your destination. There have been so many, so many accounts of what has happened. And I wanted to start from a much earlier beginning of this story, which was at the time that you first joined Google. So what made you originally choose to work at Google and what was Google like back then? I think Sammy and Jeff were at the Black and AI workshop and they were asking me what I did and they said, oh yeah, like you should come, you know, work at Google. And I was doing my postdoc at the time at Microsoft Research. I hadn't figured out what I was going to do next, but I knew I wanted to go back to the Bay Area. And I had a lot of reservations Google research was not well known for its advocacy for women. And in fact, when I when I said I was going to go to Google research, a number of people actually sat me down and like were like, hey, you know, you should know certain things, that, that kind of stuff. And they did not disappoint. Right. So um, as you can see there, it was just like constant fighting and how I was trying to approach it, which is why like this is so disappointing is I was trying to approach it as talking to people, trying to educate them, trying to send them lots of you know articles, trying to have other people educate them, going back and forth, arguing, trying to get them to see a certain point of view, even when they were completely wrong. And there are some things that they did that had such traumatizing effects on me. And so I, I kept on thinking that they could do better, you know? And so with Sammy, I mean, he has become such a huge advocate. I even wrote it in my email. I'm like, people were complaining that this organization hired just 14% women, according to their accounts or whatever. And then Sammy, my manager, hired 39% women, right? The only reason I feel like this didn't happen to me before is probably because he was protecting us. 
And then by protecting us, he would get in trouble himself. Like, because what, what happens is if other leaders are tone policing you and you're too loud, you're like a troublemaker or whatever, that's what happens, right? We all know that's what happens uh, to people like me. And then if you defend them or if you say that they're wrong, then you're obviously going to also be a problem for the other leaders. So I, I sort of felt like maybe that was happening. I don't know. So that was my two years at, at Google. And there was so much talk about diversity and inclusion, but so much hypocrisy. I'm not saying you shouldn't not hire men. Obviously, like you should hire everyone. But the problem is that I, I guess on the petition, it says I'm one of 1.6% Black women at Google. But in research, it's not 1.6%. It's way lower than that. I, I was definitely the first Black woman to be a research scientist at Google. I don't know any other... Uh, people before me were black women. And then after me, we got two, two more people, two more black women. Right. But that's like still out of so many research sites, it's like hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. Right. Like three out of God knows how many. And so at some point I was just like, you know what? I don't even want to talk about diversity and stuff. It's just exhausting. You know, you're just kind of, they want to have meetings with you. They don't listen to you. And then they want to have meetings with you again. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I've written a a million documents about a million diversity related things about racial literacy and machine learning, ML fairness initiatives about retention of women and, you know, the issues about whatever, like so many documents and so many emails, right? The, The emails are supposed to spark conversation so that we can have frank conversations in a trusted environment. If I wanted to just take them down, I wouldn't write an internal email. I would send that email to the press or something, right? But what they decided to do was, yeah, yeah, basically fire me. Citing an email. Can you imagine citing an email to a list called Brain Women and Allies? You know, I was remembering that there's not, not been a single vacation I took inside Google where I wasn't in the middle of some issue or another. Last one I remember was probably like right before the shutdown, like February, I was being tone police. So imagine somebody's shooting at you with a gun and is, and you're screaming. And instead of like trying to sh- stop the person who's shooting at you with a gun, they're t- trying to stop you from screaming. <laughs> That's how I felt. And it was just so painful to be in that position over and over and over and over again. And I even wrote about tone policing, sent them articles. I would send it to bring women and allies. Other people would send these articles, et cetera. But, you know, it turns out it didn't really work in the end. For people who are in the AI field, you successfully built one of the most diverse teams in the AI industry. So what did it actually take to do that? What were some of the obstacles that you faced? And what were some of the things that you mentioned that Sammy had to do to kind of protect all of you and make sure that there was this space to build out that kind of team and do this kind of work? People did not want me to be a manager. I was like, okay, I've started my own company before. I've started a very well-known nonprofit. Like what, I don't understand what, why do you have concerns about quote unquote concerns about me being a manager? Does she know that if she becomes a manager, then she's going to have to be a representative of Google? People also raise concerns about me seeming unhappy at Google. <laughs> right? Like It's not like, oh, there's a toxic culture that's making people like her unhappy, so let's fix that culture. No, that was not the conversation. The conversation was, she seems to be unhappy, so let's not make her a manager. I'm raising concerns, right? And Sammy was like, I think she would be a great manager. She's already had experiences, et cetera. So if I become a manager and I was livid, like at that time, I was so angry. I was asking every other person who became a manager at my level what their experience was. So why did I want to become a manager? We wanted to hire social scientists. So we put out a call. So a lot of times researchers just hire their friends or whoever, right? And we didn't want to do that. We put out a call. We got like 300 applications. We looked through them by hand because we wanted to make sure that we recruiters were not filtering out like certain groups of people. And so we wanted to make sure that this was fair. What I, why I, I thought we were making progress was because we were able to get resources to hire these people, right? So I thought that maybe Jeff was starting to support our team and, and kind of support the kinds of stuff we were doing. I never imagined, like, I don't know exactly how this thing happened. 
at all, but I just did not imagine that he would sign off on it. I can't imagine him initiating it, but even him signing off on it was was just something so surprising to me. Were you able to build relationships with other teams at Google? Were people, certain parts of the organization becoming more receptive to AI ethics issues and pushing on it alongside your team? We had a lot of requests from people uh, coming to us with issues. If they had issues about something, they wanted us to consult on things. And so, yeah, we had a lot of people. Most people on our team are inundated. One of our challenges was to not be like a fire hose, like to always be in the middle of a fire because we wanted to have foresight. So we wanted to shape what happens in the future, not just react. So that was one of the things that was a challenge. And that was one of the things that our team always talked about. Like, how do we make sure that we get time to do research? And the biggest mismatch I see is that there are so many people who respect us, but then there's people at the top, you know, don't respect our expertise or leadership. What was it about your expertise and your leadership that they didn't buy into? Even if you just see like the email from Jeff, right, who I'm assuming he didn't write this email, (laughs) you know, I'm assuming somebody wrote it, he sent it, but you see this email and it talks about that our research had gaps, that it didn't have some literature. They don't sound like they're talking to people who are experts in their area, right? So this is not peer review. This is not like reviewer two telling you, hey, there's this missing citation. This is a group of people who we don't know. We are not even supposed to know who they are high up. And they're not necessarily high up because of their expertise. Many people are high up because they've been at Google for a long time. We're given the power to shut down this research. Well, obviously you wrote about the paper. We had 128 (laughs) citations, you know? And so we, we sent this to a number of people who had recent works on bias and we asked them for feedback on our paper, along with many people at Google. And in fact, that's why some people are so shocked in, in our team, especially because they're like, what does this mean for me who I just joined? And I've never even asked for feedback this thoroughly because I want to bucket the people that we're going to ask feedback from in four buckets. One are the people who have developed large language models themselves just to get their perspective. One are people who work in the area of mitigating these models, the bias in these models. One is people who might disagree with our view. One is people who use these large language models for various things. And we have a whole document with all of this feedback that we're supposed, what we were supposed to go through to address at night, which I want to do still before we release this work. And so it wasn't like they were talking to world-renowned experts and linguists and all sorts of people like Emily Bender is not some random person who'll just put her name on a random paper out there, you know? It was, I felt like the whole thing was so disrespectful. Prior to this particular paper, were there earlier instances in in which you ever felt that Google was restricting or limiting your team's ability to conduct research? So um, there were prior instances where people had conversations with PR and policy or whatever, and they would take issue with certain wording or take issue with certain specifics. And so then the end result, the paper would be extremely watered down. And so that has happened before, but definitely not in this, this was not, that was not the process that that was used to do that watering. So that's what I thought they might do. They might try to do with this paper too, right? Like they might say, okay, we don't like this section. You should change the wording of this section. You should add this other section. I don't know. So I kept, I I wrote a document and I kept on asking them, what exactly is your feedback? Is your feedback to add a section, to remove us? Like, what does this mean? What are you asking us? Right. And so on Friday after Thanksgiving, because on Thanksgiving day, I had spent my day writing this document instead of like having a good time with my family. The next day on Friday, which is when I was supposed to retract this paper, I wrote, okay, so I have written this six page document addressing at a high level and low level, whatever feedback I can gather. And I hope that there is at the very least an openness for further conversation rather than just further orders. I wrote that email like that. I thought that if I just focused on my work, then at least I could get my work done. And now you're coming for my work. And so I, and I, I literally started crying. I was, I, I was so upset. And I was just like, 
this is just not okay. You can't just tell someone to retract, give them a retraction order without any further conversation. Who is it coming from? What what exactly is the feedback? I mean, they didn't even tell us the feedback first. They were just saying, there's too many issues with the paper to revise it. You just have to retract it. And this document is like one page or something. There, there isn't even that much. They just felt like they could just order us to retract it with no conversation. What do you think it was about this particular paper that touched off these events? Do you think that it was actually about this paper or were there other factors at play? I mean, people are talking about how, you know, if this happens to somebody as accomplished, it makes me imagine what they do to people, especially people in vulnerable groups, right? Because they take advantage of that vulnerability. They probably thought I'd be super quiet about it. So I don't know. I don't think the end result was just about this paper. Maybe they were surprised that I pushed back, coupled with the fact that I uh, spoke up a lot. I don't believe that I am popular with the HR department, but well, even their email to me cites my email to Brain Women and Allies, right? So they're, they're also not telling me that it's just about the paper. Did you ever suspect, based off of the previous events and tensions, that it would end in this way? And did you suspect the community's response after it ended in this way? I I thought that they might kind of make me miserable enough to leave or something like that. I thought that they would be smarter than doing it in this exact way because it's a confluence of so many issues. Research censorship, ethical AI, labor rights, DEI, all things that they've come under fire for before. So I thought that for their own selfishness sake, that they wouldn't do it in this way. But, uh, and the conditions I outlined were so simple that if they can't meet those conditions, then I mean, it, it just makes it hard to understand how can anybody even do research, right? Like they, I mean, I was just literally saying that we have to talk about process and we have to have a conversation and they're like, nope, you're fired, right? I found out from my direct reports, you know? They were just so traumatized. I think my team stayed up till like 4 or 5 a.m. just together, you know, trying to make sense of what happened. And going around Sammy like that, it was just all so terrible and ruthless. So I didn't expect them to do it in that way. I just thought that they would like make me miserable enough to leave. I expected some amount of support, but I definitely did not expect the amount of outpouring that there is. I mean, it's been incredible, but... I mean, people are taking so many risks right now, and that that worries me uh, because I really want to make sure that they're safe. I didn't expect that. No, I did not expect it. You've already mentioned a couple times, both in this interview and in other places, that like this is not just about you. It's not just about Google. It's a confluence of so many different issues. What does this particular experience say about tech companies' influence on AI in general and their capacity to actually do meaningful work in AI ethics? There were a number of people comparing big tech and big tobacco, maybe big oil as well, and how they were censoring research, um, even though they knew. And I used to push back a little bit on that because I used to be like, it's not like academia is, you know, so people have, I still push back on the academia versus tech dichotomy because they both have the same sort of very racist and sexist paradigm. And the education and the paradigm that you learn and that you t- take to Google or wherever starts in academia, right? So I, I don't think that the lesson is that there should be no AI ethics research in tech companies. But I think the lesson is that there a needs to be a lot more independent research, especially in this area. And our, we need to have more choices than just, you know, DARPA versus corporations. And B, there needs to be oversight of tech companies, obviously. I mean, I think this is, many people have been saying this, but at this point, I just don't understand how we can continue to think that they're going to self-regulate or self, any of it. I think academic institutions and conferences need to rethink their relationships with big corporations and the kind, the amount of money they're, they're taking from them to, you know, there's too much of an imbalance of power right now when you have this kind of thing heavily influenced by corporations. What does it mean to actually do meaningful AI ethics work? (laughs) Oh, wow, you gave me like the hardest question. Um, I think maybe it means that you 
can question the fundamental premises and fundamental issues. You, you don't have to just cover things up or you don't have to just be reactionary, that you can have foresight about the future and you can get in early on while products are being thought about and developed and not just kind of do things after the fact to cover things up. That's, I think that's the number one thing I think about and that the people most impacted by the technology should have a say, should have a, a very big say starting from the very beginning. Do you, in a way, see yourself as a martyr? No. I mean, I think that Google might have made me one. I wasn't trying to be one. I'm hoping that I'm more of an agent for change. But yeah, but I think they they kind of made me one more so than I would have been if they didn't do this to me. This interview was edited for length and clarity. It was reported by Karen Howe, edited by me, Neil Firth, Gideon Litchfield, and Michael Riley, with production assistance from Anthony Green, Emma Silicons, and Benji Rosen. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong. This is MIT Technology Review.